I forgot to put slide one on my deck, which is why you've all been treated to the big reveal. <laughs> and I hope you've had a really nice chance to look at these gorgeous pictures of phage, because what I want to tell you is that the future of gene engineering and genetic engineering is the past of genetic engineering. One of the reasons bacteria keep CRISPR around and keep changing CRISPR and evolving new ones is because they're in competition and in close proximity to phage. And you might think of phage as bacteria viruses, but then you're going to think viruses, ooh, make the bacteria sick, kill them. Actually, most viruses, even ones that don't infect bacteria, we think now that most viruses on the planet are not pathogenic. They don't cause disease. They're sort of reservoirs of interesting genetic information, but they're still very pushy about it. So I like to think less of CRISPRs as immune systems and less of phage as dangerous things, and more as really pushy encyclopedia salesmen. They're really like, hey, have you heard the word? You want some? <laughs> and the bacteria are like, uh, I don't have time for that today. But sometimes they do need it. They do have time for it. And this is why the systems persist, that there are, there are reasons to do it. And that's why you would probably want to think of CRISPR and CRISPRs less as an immune system and more as a genome regulatory system. So you heard a little bit about restriction sites, the first wave of genetic engineering in the 70s. I would say phage have been doing it for a little longer. But <laughs> phage have been fighting with bacteria about when they get to put that DNA in for so long that they have great systems to actually break and change restriction enzymes. So restriction modification systems, restriction enzymes, appear in about 90% of the bacteria on the planet. They're everywhere, it's amazing. CRISPRs only appear in about 40% of bacteria. So they're less, they're less common. But um, they're in 90% of the archaea, which is a special branch of other type of life, and we can talk about that definitely later, ask me anything. So the uh, phage and bacteria have been working on this sort of dance for a long time. And what keeps happening in biotechnology is we trip into it. We tripped into restriction enzymes. We're like, why is this phage not killing this bacteria? Oh, what's that? Why is this happening? Oh, what's that? Now we have a new tool. So you might have heard previously to tonight and tonight that uh, CRISPRs are an immune system, and I'm telling you now they're a genetic regulatory system, genome re regulatory system, and you're still thinking maybe that's still about keeping the phage under control. But you guys, <laughs> this is a bacteria, the blue bits in this sort of um, fake electron. It's hard to take pictures of cells at this scale. So what you're seeing on the left is a macrophage, which is a human immune cell, and it's been cracked open by the process of having the picture taken. Yeah, that's, that's how. And the right, it's been cracked open by the process of the bacteria popping it open. So we're, you're looking at a macrophage that has been popped open. In both pictures, what's spilling out, or what's in false color blue here, is a bacteria called Francisella tularemia, which causes a disease you probably haven't heard of called tularemia. You can get it from rabbit meat, sometimes from aerosol from um, lawn clippings. So like, yeah, anything could kill you, but don't worry, it won't. Uh, <laughs> This bacteria is what we like to call an obligate intracellular parasite, which basically means it needs to go for part of its life cycle into another cell to finish its life cycle. So it goes into your macrophages. That's part of why it causes disease. In order to have your macrophage, whose job is to absorb things and then kill them, that's how your macrophages work, is they float around in your bloodstream, look for bacteria that shouldn't be there, and engulf them and then kill them. This guy is getting engulfed and beating the macrophage. It's a pretty neat trick, unfortunately, if you have tularemia. But otherwise, how, we don't know how, we didn't know how it was avoiding the macrophage actually triggering the kill. It turns out it uses its own CRISPR system. So its immune system is working on itself, like an autoimmune disease, to when it gets immune systemed by your immune system, <laughs> It's so cool. When they knocked out the CRISPR system in this bacteria, they started to be, see the macrophages just start to kill it. We don't know yet how widely the effects and impacts and regulation of CRISPR systems in the wild go. 
And uh, that's another thing I want to share with you is uh, we've been talking a lot about CRISPR-Cas9. That is a minority, of a really tiny minority of the kinds of CRISPR systems that are out there. So I told you 40% of bacteria have a CRISPR system, and they work like programmable drone strikes, right, which is why we've sort of borrowed them for use in other organisms. Well, that's a type 2 CRISPR system. This is what it looks like in the wild before the engineers have, like, whittled it down. The most prolific type of CRISPR system is found in 80% uh, of the bacteria that have any kind of CRISPR system is a type 1. And there's not a bioengineer on the planet yet who has figured out how to patent that. Uh, the, uh, le a less common in bacteria and much more common in archaea is the type 3 at the bottom. And you can see they all they have in common with each other is that CRISPR, the memory. That is where the cell writes all the pushy encyclopedia salesmen. You know, when you hit, you get a spam call on your phone and you hit block, that's the block list. That's the only thing they have in common. It was really easy to spot in the genome data, and that's why they called it a CRISPR. It's a clustered, regularly interspaced palindromic repeat. It's easier to say CRISPR. I agree. But here's some interesting baseball cards for you. So the most <laughs> blocked memory, <laughs> that's an archaea called Haliangium ochreisium, and it has 812 blocked numbers. Where do you live? <laughs> you need to move to a better neighborhood. The most CRISPRs, because you can have one CRISPR that has all that memory in it, or you could have multiple arrays. Some of these bacteria have many, many of them, and not just the array, but the whole genetic system. They might have 16 sets of this. This guy has 23. He only remembers 233 uh, phage, but he has 23 different CRISPRs, so I think he's probably just disorganized. <laughs> This, he's also in archaea. This guy down in the bottom left, the Streptococcus thermophilus, has all three types of CRISPRs in one genome. And I've looked at a lot of genomes, and I don't see that very often. So I, also, that is the bacteria that you make your yogurt with. It's a, he's a good guy. I love that. He's one of my favorites. <laughs> no one has ever observed a CRISPR in chlamydia. It's another reason to hate chlamydia, <laughs> as if you needed one. So the, the main reason bacteria have so many different kinds is because they work in different ways and they've evolved uh, in different ways. But also then um, you might think, okay, I know how Cas9 works now. There are so many different Cas9s, so they don't all exactly work the same way. And when the bacteria meet each other at the bar and kind of like swap information, they kind of recombine their CRISPR systems and come up with new ways to do it even. The only thing that seems to be in common is this. The salesman comes and injects some DNA and says, you want to try this? And two genes in the CRISPR cassette go, uh, no, we're not going to try that, but we're going to remember you <laughs> for next time. <laughs> well, you're, <laughs> you're not even going to get in the door next time. And they write that into the CRISPR array, and they always write it at the front end. So if you wait around as a phage long enough, maybe they'll forget about you. You can kind of think of CRISPRs as a history, a genetic memory of the encounters the bacteria had. It's part of why it was so hard to figure out exactly what they were doing. You sequence it, and then you look at those sequences, and you check your sequence database to see, what is this? And uh, you heard Ellen mention um, Dr. Mojica. When he looked, he would only get one or two hits. That's really small amount of data to make an inference from. It was a very clever inference he made, and it's easily backed up. You can watch it happen. But when he was looking, it was so hard because the phage changed. They're like, oh, I can't get any more. I need to change how I look. But this is how the CRISPR gets written. This is the most basic part. Type 2 CRISPR systems you're slightly more familiar with. You've heard of the Cas9. And the guide RNA is derived from this process where the CRISPR becomes that single strand that Ellen told you about, the RNA. And it gets processed by the Cas9 into what looks like a guide RNA and then it searches for that annoying salesman's message and cuts it up. That's how a type 2 CRISPR system works. And this is why bioengineers like it, because it's basically one protein. That's, oh, that's, it's so hard to get stuff into human cells. Let's just make it only one thing we have to get in there, maybe two with the guide RNA. And that's, that's been a big step forward for you eukaryotic editing. It's really, really helpful. Still lots of stuff to do and lots of advances to make. But um, I'm the germ wrangler. My favorite bit about CRISPR is that I don't have to get it in the cell. It's already in there, right? All my cells have built-in genome editing toolkits. Type 1 CRISPR systems, the most popular one, though, they don't work anything like a Cas9 works. 
they use a bunch of proteins to process that CRISPR into little targets and then to go find them. And then they don't even do the same thing that Cas9 does and just cut once. They cut a lot of times. You just chew it up. It's really cool. <laughs> Nobody knows, as far as I know. When you're a scientist, you learn to qualify things. As far as I know, we're not sure exactly how type 3 systems work. If you find out, let me know. Because I probably missed it, and I should know. But um, we just don't. We don't know. We don't know. I can't wait to find out. It's super cool. Also, yeah, it'll be super cool. But what I really want to impress upon you is the depth and the breadth of these systems and how they're so old, we didn't even know they were there, but they're everywhere. And maybe you're still thinking, yeah, but it's bacteria, they're kind of like tiny and um, who cares? And you probably saw in school that bacteria are the least important thing in the tree of life, right? They're down at the bottom, not up here with us lofty people, <laughs> right? Clearly, we are the end point of evolution and the whole point of the exercise, because just look at us. Uh, yeah, and you know, I guess the bacteria would agree. <laughs> I like this representation better because it doesn't put something on the top. But still, it's highly biased, but it, it's a famous image, the great tree of life. And everything you can see from, uh, from the green here all the way over, those are all things you can see with your eyes. So this is also quite biased. The green, the green bit to the left is plants, and then all, man, again, is the very tip of the branch, because of course we calibrate on ourselves because we're awesome. But there are five nonillion prokaryotes, we think maybe, and they have a biomass equal to all the plants on the planet. So why are they relegated to just this tiny little bit of the picture? In fact, they're so different from each other in some ways that we are more closely related right here in some measures, so I, this is a great one to argue about with other scientists, we just love to argue about this. Here's corn, here's a mushroom, here's us. These are all bacteria. And this is a representation of distance and relatedness and things. This is one way to measure. We are not that great, honestly, compared to bacteria in my opinion. <laughs> also, you carry about five pounds of bacteria around with you in order to live. They take up space, they protect you from things killing you, they sometimes get you, sometimes they do get you. <laughs> but we find microbes very, very useful. Now, I know many of you are indulging in some beer. I was thinking um, backstage while listening to like, it would be weird to drink other secretions from animals. Like, yeah, it would. But <laughs> yeast make alcohol. Can we call that yeast milk? I, I, now, I, I don't always like to put beer up here because that's technically a fungus and not a bacteria, but you can call it a microbe, so we're going to give it a pass. But other things on here, sometimes you might not know that one of the things we domesticated in our march to the top of the tree of life were bacteria. So xanthan gum, which if any of you like molecular gastronomy or industrial food processes know is a gum that is used for stabilizing food. It's only made in one kind of bacteria called Xanthomonas campestris. It's the only way it's made. Every time you eat xanthan gum, you're eating something that came from a bacteria. Pickles are made pickled by bacteria. MSG, all the MSG on the planet is made by a bacteria called Corinobacterium glutamicum. It's literally discovered in sewer water, but don't let that put you off. <laughs> Lots of cheeses and yogurts. Bacteria, some fungus in there too, but uh, the best ones are bacteria, clearly. <laughs> olives, some of the processes that don't involve lye for making olives involve bacteria. Tacrolimus is a um, immune system suppressant used in patients who are having organ transplants. It's only made in a bacteria. Bread, that's another yeast one, we can forget about it. Uh, vinegar <laughs> is a quite often fermented, if it doesn't come from petroleum-based processes, is fermented by vinegar-making bacteria, acetic acid bacteria. And then erythromycin is considered by the World Health Organization to be an antibiotic that if you don't have it, you can't have a first class health care system. It is only made in a bacteria called Saccharopelis erythria. That's the only way to get it. So some of these bacteria are quite useful. They're all still kind of hard to work with. And then we can jump to the ones that haven't made themselves useful yet but seem to have a lot of promise. Guys. 
The bacteria in the top left, do you see those black dots inside of it? Those are magnets. <laughs> it makes its own magnets. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. <laughs> it lives in fresh water, and it uses its magnets to align itself with the Earth's magnetic field <laughs> so that it can know which way is up and which way is down. And it needs to know which way is up and which way is down so it can move to or from oxygen because it likes a very specific amount of oxygen dissolved in its water. Thank you very much. And if it's too much, it'll die. And if it's too little, it'll die. So it uses a magnet to keep itself pointed <laughs> north-south so now it knows which way is up and which way is down. <laughs> the bacteria on the top right lives in wastewater, really pee-heavy wastewater. I call it piss water. It's not all piss, but it's pretty nitrogenous. And in order to live there, it has to do something with the nitrogen, because what else are you going to do? And in the process of doing something with the nitrogen, but not the end goal, this is not its end goal, it's just a happy accident, it makes hydrazine. It makes rocket fuel. Well, that rocket fuel is just, like I said, an, a midpoint on its way to something actually healthy. And so it needs to kind of sequester it so it doesn't kill itself with it, and it makes these membranes that are stacked with this molecule here, and if anyone has any familiarity with chemistry, they'll know carbon does not like to be in a four-membered ring. That ladder, that box structure, that is carbon that's under a lot of stress. It's also explosive, right? <laughs> when, when molecules are under that much stress, they tend to like to let go easily. And it was thought for a long time that nothing biological could make something like that. So I guess if you want to do it, you got to live in pee, but... <laughs> The middle left, this is a bacteria that all those tiny grids, what it's doing is it has these sort of uh, inflatable vesicles, balloons, that it controls its position in the water column with. So it can deflate and inflate sort of to rise and fall. And guess it's chasing oxygen again. It likes to move around. The middle one is a symbiont of plants. So one thing that I told you was that five pounds of you is about is bacteria, plants are similarly dependent on bacteria to survive, except they're kind of like, you're like a space ship, you move around. Plants are like space stations, they stay put. But then around them is all this bacteria. And there's a whole economy going on there. And the currency of the economy was nitrogen, is nitrogen. So these bacteria fix nitrogen from the air. They pull it out of the gas and give it into a form the plants can use. And then when they're doing that, you don't have to fertilize those guys. It's pretty cool. The bacteria on the right in the middle makes this perfect nanolayer over its surface called an S layer. It's one protein that self assembles into a nanostructure. And yeah, the nanoscientists are studying it. They're like, how do you do that? It just does. Bottom left, this is at this point sort of like boring, but this bacteria turns sunlight into sugar. Whatever. <laughs> the bacteria on the right. All those bumps on it are these extracellular machines called cellulosomes, and this is the reason we're not wading around hip deep in like fallen leaves and grass clippings. If you ever wondered where those go, <laughs> these guys turn it into something somebody else can eat. They're <coughs> decomposers. But all of these guys have CRISPRs, and uh, they're not really interested in pushy salesmen like Phage or me asking them to do these things more or differently or in a fermenter so that I can sell their sweet, sweet secretions. <laughs> For us, the future of genetic engineering really is going to be the future of figuring out how phage get past these, sy these systems so that we, too, can get past these systems. And what we want to do is build a domestication pipeline. <laughs> we want to start, like, you know, you get your dog breeders, and you're like, oh, look. I mean, there's great documentaries about, oh, they can still make new dogs. They're like, we want a dog that can smell a bomb from, like, 200 miles away. And the dog breeder's like, gotcha. <laughs> and what you're missing is that we spent 20,000 years making that really easy to do in dogs. So the hard way, the slow way, but now it's, it's relatively fast. Dogs are really supremely <laughs> domesticated. I, uh, tell, I ask students sometimes, little kids, like grad students get offended when you do this, but like, can you name some domestic animals? And the kids will shout out stuff, and when they get to cat, I'm like, nope, wrong. <laughs> oh. and my golden retriever, if I leave him in the backyard, he is not going to get out and start killing squirrels and like making a life for himself. You know, He's not going to break bad. 
he's not. He's truly domesticated. When we use domestic animal, we are really importing a namespace, a sort of pragma. We're importing all the connotations of safety. A lot of these bacteria don't have that. They might have something else, though. If um, one, for me, if it's not doing something cool, we'll get to it later. Okay, we have issues. We have climate change. We have food. We, 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 need, we have stuff to help me or just stay out of the way for the most part. That's not a very scientific or responsible attitude, but it is my attitude. So next is if you can grow it in the laboratory. If you can't, it's truly feral. If it only lives in your gut and you try to bring it into the laboratory, it's like, I don't want anything to do with you, is it's saying. It's basically snarling at you. So that's one thing we can fix. There's no such thing as uncultivable bacteria. You might hear that place. There's like, oh, there's so much bacteria we can't grow. It's true. Most of the bacteria we know about, we don't know how to grow it in the lab yet. That's different from it can't be grown in the lab. We haven't tried hard enough yet. We'll get there. I will get there. So if you can't cultivate it, the answer is to make it cultivable, but that's still, it's still a process right now. We're working on it. The next is transformable. Transformable is a special science term that means can you put DNA in it? And it means slightly more than that because it means when you put the DNA in there, does it stay and do something? Because if it doesn't, well, then you might as well, you're, you're, it, it, why did you waste all that DNA? <laughs> So if it's not transformable, you have to make it transformable, and that's some science stuff. We could go down the rabbit hole later. But next is, okay, now that it's transformable, do you have, like Ellen mentioned, the tools that someone else has kind of packaged up for you, so all you have to do is have your bright idea and do one little thing, and boom, you have an experiment. That's called a genetic toolkit in this sense. It's a set of things that other people have worked really hard to make so that now you can do brilliant science and look like you've built it all from the ground up. Most bacteria on the planet are not transformable currently. Most of them, almost all of them, you might hear, oh, we can do this in bacteria. They're talking about one bacteria. <laughs> and I just told you there were a million of them. And even in that one, this genetic toolkit is not as complete as it could be. So we have a lot of infrastructure work to do before we can call ourselves masters of the tree of life. So the next step is to build or improve a genetic toolkit. And the next step, this is I think where our lab bacteria that we let high school students play with and that we use as a model, it's tame. It's, it hangs out in the lab. It's not very good at living without us, but it's still, you know, it's still. The next question is, can you make it depend on you? Can you make it safe? Can you make it so if you leave it in the backyard, it's like, oh crap, oh crap, oh crap, and it dies. Which, you, it's okay, you can laugh because it's a bacteria, who cares? <laughs> Then we call that domesticated. And when it's domesticated, we can start biomanufacturing. I want to make antibiotics. I want to make petrochemical replacements so we don't crack up old fossil fuel from inside the, and I like to think of fossil fuel as really, 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 really old biofuel. Because right, it's mostly plant matter. It's just we don't have the time to go through that process with biomass. We'd rather use raw biomass like lawn clippings. Nobody wants that. So can we turn lawn clippings into Fuel. Can we turn it into medicine? This is the future, I think, of genetic engineering. We're very, like I said, we're at the top of the tree of life, so we're like, can we make ourselves better? Can we? <laughs> I think we can, but we can also make our lives easier and make it less necessary that we're fighting cancer if we make our environment cleaner. And we can enhance our ability to do that if we also work alongside our genetic needs our uh, medical needs, on our environmental and our agricultural needs, and bacteria are the perfect partners for that. So a germ wrangler's job, the future of genetic engineering, and something I hope we will all work together on, is to turn feral, weird wolf things that keep hanging around the camp and eating from the trash pile into sort of tame things that let you poke them a bit, and then into buddies that do whatever you tell them to, ha <laughs> ha. That's the future of genetic engineering, thank you. or other things that are we kind of like, oh, we see how this works, let's, let's try and replicate it. Are there, is there like, um, are there efforts that are trying to go like a level smaller or like, like, like actually building smaller nano, nano tools that just like ignore, ignore the, the biologic present, just say like, why don't we just like rip open this thing, insert where we want, and 
Are you an engineer? Because yeah. <laughs> what I just heard is, oh man, cells sound complex and hard. Can we get around that? So the, for the first part of your question, what it's called when you look at uh, science it's, uh, and take inspiration from it, it's called bioprospecting. So the form of bioprospecting everyone's familiar with is, don't let the rainforest die. We haven't checked all of it yet for useful anti-cancer drugs, right? That's bioprospecting. <laughs> what you just described is something different, which is like, I really don't have time to grow things, feed things, or risk that they make imperfect copies of themselves that I'm not in perfect control of, right? And this is where biological engineering differs from some of the other fields of engineering. We have to embrace the fundamental law of biology, which is that things make imperfect copies of themselves. There's a lot of strengths to it, though. I know it's frustrating. I know it's frustrating to not be able to like draw a circuit board and be like, it's going to work every time. But there are benefits in that. <laughs> Sorry. There are benefits in that um, because evolution is this ratchet. It's a random ratchet. It just tries things and some stuff works. Cells are so small and relatively cheap. They do it in such high, this, you'll like this one. It's massively parallel. It's massively parallel. Cells can try more combinations of things than you can. And they try it all almost at the same time without you even realizing it. You, you give it an objective and you give it some tools to go with. Like it's not like uh, the people who started with the wolf were like, yeah, that golden retriever is exactly what I'm going for. <laughs> right? But they tried lots of, they were able to try lots of things almost at random. They're like, hey, that's working. So in that sense, maybe it's less bioprospecting and more like, like bioengineering. Let's let it try. And that's one of the big upsides for not having complete control of it is having it try so much of the solution space simultaneously. And we've harnessed this so successfully with corn, like you saw, with uh, dogs, with so many things on this planet we've harnessed that I am still a little, you can tell, a little antsy about people going, well, okay, let's just do this in silico. <laughs> let's just build these machines. I want to explore both. I want you to engineer, and the engineers have, and they're so smug, it, I, but I get it. <laughs> I'm stuck to my iPhone, I get it, I get it. You deserve to be smug. You, engineer you, not you, you. I don't know, you could be smug too, it's fine. But I want to also mature bioengineering as a field of engineering that, you know, can do it. Other questions? Why? Um, so in terms of the, what Ellen brought up about how to get more people engaged in these discussions, I'm struck by the fact that most of the 200 or so dog breeds were invented so elites could hunt animals on their private parks that were enclosed so that others could not farm on them anymore or use the, the far, you know, forest as Super useful, farm. right? Yeah, so they were really useful if you were 1% of 1% of English royalty or French royalty or whatever. Not so useful otherwise, they're just kind of naked dogs who shiver a lot in Park Slope. So how do you, <laughs> what were some social efforts? Like, Jamie Sylvain famously is a socialist born in India who wanted, you know, sort of a Marxist revolution in England. He didn't get that. And instead, he got you know his superpower devolving into our hyperpower <laughs> that is now just some sort of bizarre, non-regulated, um, you know, anti-political space. How could we have a new politics where people know more about uh, technologies like CRISPR and actually all get to sort of vote on which dog breed we make next and, and what features are useful? This is a little high-level response, but I think it's important to note most science, most basic research, and still even most uh, transitional research, so how to get a basic science idea into an applied science idea, is funded by the government. You're paying for it. You are paying for it. Um, certain ways the system functions now mean that scientists are not rewarded for engaging the public. We're not it rewarded in a career way for engaging with lay people. That's not how you get tenure. It's not. Uh, you could have a big say in it if the funding, if um, our responsibility for funding didn't go through organizations and went through organizations, again, got to Congress. And then, of course, you're yelling at Congress. Um, this, the communication lines are a little convoluted. And then because scientists aren't rewarded for communicating, they're definitely not bothering to make sure that you know how important it is that you say to Congress, we want you to fund the national labs. We want you to fund the NIH. We want you to fund the CDC. We want you to fund the Department of Energy Labs where they work on agriculture and all the microbes that are keeping the plants that feed us alive. We want you to fund the USDA. You have to tell your Congress people that. And that's one way you get to vote on what science gets worked on. 
you already have the power. It's an atrophied muscle. because people suck at controlling the bacteria. With CRISPR technology, is it in the realm to neuter? Basically, we have one bacteria that causes cavities, and we have about 19 that cause any severity of gum disease. Is it within the realm of CRISPR to kind of maybe hobble these bacteria, or is changing the whole flora a little bit beyond that? We change the whole flora all the time, right? We raise a uh, forest and like, now we're gonna grow corn here. Uh, so my first bioengineering response to that would be, yeah, it might be possible. We definitely wanna make sure the taxpayers are on board and it's all ethical and, and done safely and, and, and stuff. But that uh, the proper answer might be to sort of work on the bacteria that are already inhabiting your mouth and sort of take away, see the sense the subtractive quality of my bioengineering, I'm going to take away their ability, the, the knack that they have of pitting your teeth. Rather than in introducing a new bacteria that then they have to compete or anything, I think the subtle bioengineering way would be, yes, to work with those bacteria, really pinpoint what their behavior is. Because you kind of do want bacteria in your mouth. You, you don't want it to be aseptic. But yeah, can we work with them? Uh, uh, similar, like, would you like to stop farting? <laughs> no? Y'all, y'all are like pro farts. <laughs> I don't want to be full of methane. We can make them so sweet, but the reason you fart is bacteria. Then when you eat, lots of stuff you eat cannot be digested by you, and so it's a tasty treat for your five pounds. And some of that gets broken down and made into gas. Yeah. So maybe we could even work with bacteria so we don't, I mean, cavities are bad. But are they worse than farts? <laughs> Reasonable people could disagree. But yes, your idea is sound. We should work with the bacteria that are causing problems, and in light of the idea that many bacteria don't, can we all work together to, yeah, I think CRISPR is a technology. It's, it's real hot right now, and everyone's like, let's CRISPR everything. But there's other older ways to do it, and just you know, being friends with bacteria was older than CRISPR, so we can still do that too. One more question. Well, thank you guys for coming out, um, and thank you to all of our wonderful speakers. Um, we, we're going to keep doing this every once in a while, so please sign up for our mailing list and follow us on Facebook and all that stuff. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Union Hall, for hosting us. Thank you, everybody.